It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show. Recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely, gorgeous, uh, tranquil, but also exciting Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, comics.aedl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, uh, creating characters, worlds that people believe in, uh, writing stories visually, and also the lifestyle of a cartoonist. All the stuff that surrounds this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Droz, carto cartoonist and teaching artist. And uh, I guess we might want to call this one BDs are great because my guest is Nicholas Bannister, or just Bannister. Uh, Hi. Uh, calling Jersey. all the way from France. That's right. And what time is it there right now? Uh, it's uh, six thirty p.m. Oh, okay. I thought it was. So, oh, my calculations yeah, it's, uh, were six, six more hours than you, so it's almost dinner time. So you're two hours away from Greenwich Mean Time. I was looking into the different time zones. That's and, right. Uh, okay, so, uh, but yes, of facebookcom slash Nicholas period Bannister and uh, the author, or the artist of the Elsewhere Chronicles. And uh, contributor to almost every flight anthology. Yeah, every single one of them except the first one. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's a lot. That's seven actually. But that's that's so that you, you can't miss your work. <laughs> no, no, no. And then <laughs> it's, and, it's unmissable. And then uh, Tib and Tum Tum, which is coming out in October or November, uh, right. in in the in the near future, the autumn of 2013. Uh, Tib and Tum Tum uh -huh. comes out, and then also the upcoming book Exodus. Uh, you've done a lot of stuff, and uh, you, we, as I hinted, you are from France, where uh, people actually appreciate comics. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to be a bit di diversified about what I do because uh, you know uh, it's all, it's always tough to to make a book. I mean, you you make you make your you make your book. It's like seven, maybe eight months of work. After that, you're just like dry, and you don't want to 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 hear about about it anymore. And unless you are super super strong, but that's not my case. And I need to to go get some fresh air to to come back stronger after a while. So for that, I I chose to do several. Uh, series at the same time, so of course it's a bit time-consuming, and I've got to sh to schedule my my stuff pretty well because I've got I'm working with several writers and publishers, so it's a bit complicated sometimes. But I mean, I need to do that to to go to different places to to come back fresh. So working on different different kinds of stories helps keep you fresh and limber. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, we, we we will talk about this later on in the show. You also design really amazing posters, um, the the iconic footwear in movies and TV, uh, mm -hmm. the pole position piece that you did recently. We'll talk about that a little bit in, in a little bit, and we'll talk more about because we're going to talk a lot about Elsewhere Chronicles today. Because uh, as I told you in the email, uh, oh by the way, before we dive into the actual topic, I wanted to know. You said there's a story behind the name Bannister. Oh yeah. Uh <coughs> Yeah, that's the name I was. I, I was you know, ten years ago when I started making comics. I, I didn't want to use my my real name, and so I was looking for uh, for a, for a, a pseudonym. I mean, a working name, a pen name, and um, and at at that time I was working with my my former girlfriend, which is now my wife. Uh, we were working on a um, how to call that a ghost hunters story and we were watching Frighteners uh, from Peter Jackson with Michael J. Fox. And um, the main character in Frighteners is named Frank Bannister, if I'm right. And that's where I picked up my, my pen name, actually. Just yeah. stole it from the movie. <laughs> it's, it's a movie I like and, and, and we were really in that mood at the time, so it's great. And I needed some, some name that could be pronounced uh, internationally with not too many mistakes to be made. That, so that is a good be. idea. <laughs> that is a really good idea, and I wish I would have thought of that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, yeah, my, my name has been anglicized to Jersey, but it's actually pronounced Yeja, but no one can say that unless they're no. from Eastern Europe. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm stuck with Jersey, but I, if I had a little bit more foresight, I would have come up with a... So, is, 
Why didn't you want to go by your real name? Is there any reason behind that? Or is it just, is that just common practice? To use it's like name? super complicated with, um, with letters that are really not really well pronounceable in, in English mostly yeah. because it's the main language I use mm -hmm. outside of French. And, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit complicated to say, so mm -hmm. it, it would be like torn apart and, and misspelled <laughs> like all the time. Right. <laughs> right. And the reason I finally decided that Jersey's fine, just call me Jersey, because I got so tired of hearing people go, Yaji? Yiju? Yeah. <laughs> no, just, just Jersey. That just works. It's fine. I don't care anymore. It's just super tiring in the <laughs> to rectify people all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes perfect sense. So, okay. So, I, I'm, I said an email to you. is like, you know, the way I like to do the show is I like to bring a guest on and look at their work and find what jumps out at me as this is the thing that they do better than anybody else and, oh, wow. and and when i was reading the elsewhere chronicles i was blown away by a your design the character design environment design just fantastic mm -hmm. and then also your compositions i mean especially like i was telling you before we started recording book five of the elsewhere chronicles uh oh my gosh something happened and all the shots are just amazing in that yeah. in that book uh but i've got examples through all all uh, the first five books that we can talk about today. But I want to start with fantasy design. Uh, and especially because you're in pre-production on this new book, Exodus, which comes out next year, and you've been posting uh -huh. on your Facebook page um, explorations, tests, and uh, e examinations of designing an environment. And uh, I could just use Elsewhere Chronicles as an example. Is like The thing I noticed is all of your fantasy environments uh, shape plays a vital role. You use very elegant and simple shapes, deceptively simple shapes, <laughs> uh, where a rock face or a wall will be rendered almost entirely in squares, which seems counterintuitive. Like, well, rocks aren't shaped like squares, but it looks right in your world. And then uh, you have this tree that's like made of like winding tubes almost looks like. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know the one I'm talking about. Yeah, I know the one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's actually it's in it's in book five. It's on page yeah. forty three. Forty three. And it looks like these these winding tubes. I didn't pull this one up, Matt, uh, as an example, so I'll just put it on the camera here. But 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 yeah, so I'm I'm just curious, like so when you're getting script from a writer or or notes from a writer or a premise, mm -hmm. uh how do you, like, one of the things you said before we started recording was making it look simple is so hard. Like, what, what is the decision-making process in, it's, yeah, yeah in, 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 in creating a world that feels like it belongs to itself? Uh, usually, I, I read, the, um, when I get the script, I read it twice. First time, uh, just to enjoy the story and see if it flows and if it's good. And that's it. And the second time, I try to picture things. And um, the things I picture usually are the, I mean, the most efficient ones are the first one I picture. I, I'm Basically, I'm not trying to go uh, beyond my first vision or my first impression. I mean, I, I, so I, I just sketch very simple things uh, like the, the square rocks or the the giant tree like made from vines and stuff and it's uh it's just very very small and quick visions i've got when i read that the the, the script and um and then I, I i elaborate a little bit around that i try to find different ways to picture it the way i want and um but i, I try to keep it simple but the key to keep it simple is to work hard on it i mean it's uh there is nothing that flows, that is very uh, fluid, that is very um, obvious, that you can do without a great amount of work uh, yeah. before that, I mean, on that. It's, um, it's, uh, it's just the paradox of, the, of creation. I mean, you, you've got the same thing, um, let's take for instance, uh, the Pixar movie, because they are like a reference in the, in the business, and you've got uh, those movies, they seem to be like very simple stories and they are very um, obvious and they are 
they don't seem very complicated, but they are really well polished and they are they are clean and the clogs works perfectly all together. But this requires an amount of work that is just insane. I mean, you've got to define your story and you've got to explore any way possible to tell the right thing at the right time, the right way. And it's very complicated and you've got to, to do that in art as well when you when you design a world or a universe. Yeah. And basically that's the, the premise of working on a, on, a, on a fantasy book for me, actually. And after that you've got some ideas, you don't even know where, where they come from and you just go with it because it's a cool idea. And it's just like the, oh, let's do square rocks because I haven't seen that in, in, a, in a book before. Right. Let's try if it works. And whoa, it works. So yeah, <laughs> let's keep it. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I use it and, and it works because most of the time which, which works right are the contrasts. Like for instance, my characters, they are a bit, they are round shaped, they are cartoony and putting them in a very, in a very uh, square environment, it works even, even more. I mean, you've got that contrast that makes a balance in, in that universe. Now that I think about that, yeah, there's a scene where the characters fall into a pit and you have all these smooth shaped characters and the pit is rendered entirely in triangles and mm -hmm. squares, right? And, and, and they're, they're all warm colors and the background is all cool colors, right? So you yeah. have that contrast there. Yeah, there are easy, easy things to, to put on. I mean, I mean, they're not easy visuals to do, but they are, we, we know this is a recipe that works. I mean, when you do contrast of that. Like that. It's uh, it's something uh, you will see when you notice it. You will see that like everywhere, uh, in 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 the in the, in the, bo in the books that are appealing, very appealing to you. They are very. Yeah, everybody is using the same recipes, so they are not using it the same way as I do, which is interesting because that's what makes us different and some people are more inclined to like that kind of style or that kind of style but usually you try to do pretty much the same thing do you do you spend do you make an effort to be observant of these contrasts in your day-to-day -day life because I'll tell you one of the things I teach comics classes and one of the things that I find my students have a, a, a real hard time with is when they're designing something they're so hung up on the drawing part and drawing it correctly that they uh, they don't think about the design element they're just trying to draw something well and yeah. so I created an exercise where I said take your digital cameras go for a walk and every time you see something that makes you say cool or neat don't overthink it just grab a picture of it and then the next class we put the pictures all out and we we examine them to see what is attracting their eye now you have a sense of where your design sensibilities fall. And I had students noticing things like, hey, you know what I pick, uh, picked up? I went for a walk at night, and the street lamp had an orangish color, and the shadow from the tree had a purplish color. And I was like, ah, you just discovered color contrast and the way light creates opposite colors in its shadows. You know, If I asked them to draw that, they would be stuck on drawing it well. But by making them go out and observe before they draw, suddenly yeah. their work improved. I mean, do you, is this something that you train yourself to do, is to be observant of those kinds of things? I try to, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm not very good at colors, for yeah. starters, so we, which is like a kind of a handicap for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm not very good at that. I, I, I'm okay at, at drawings and maybe designs too, but colors, it's not my style, so it's not my, my, my thing. And mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's why I've got a colorist most of the time, <laughs> which... I mean, who does a wonderful job on, on the Elsewhere Chronicles. And, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, but, but those are the, exactly the, the kind of things you've got to, to be attentive to. But, you know, when you... I, I don't notice it anymore. Uh, I mean, I, I used to try to, 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 to notice that in the street and everywhere. And right now, it's, uh, it's just part of my job. So it's... It's it's really part of me, so so I, I don't I don't notice that kind of stuff, but you've got to be. Uh, the thing is, uh, more importantly, the thing is you've got to be behind a camera screen to notice that. It's got to be framed 
I mean, it's going to be framed and in 2D. And uh, I've got all the pain to notice that without that interface uh, between the world and me. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can see amazing things in, um, in real life. But if it's not like on, on screen and in 2D, I will have uh, some troubles to, to see the shapes and what's very powerful and the, the contrast and stuff like that. So it's, it's a bit complicated to, to explain, but it, it, yeah, it's, it's got to be translated on a, on a, on a, on, on a flat screen to be, to be noticed by, by me. But uh, yeah, that's why I always carry a, a camera with me. I mean, most of the time I try to carry a camera, a camera and take a lot of pictures of everything. I noticed that but in your, in your uh, environment designs for Exodus, mm. you were using photography. You were using photos right. of, of real environments, and then you were making drawings from those. So you, first you post the photo with a drawing of the character in there, and then the next post that you do is, a, is now the background is a complete drawing. And then you start adding color and different effects, and we watch this thing grow. And it's, it was so cool to see that you actually work from photography first. That's something that I showed my students saying, see, this is how the French do it, <laughs> and they make the best comics, so let's copy that, please. Yeah, you, you can do. I mean, you, you've got, uh, you can use pretty much whatever you want to, to obtain the results you are looking for. And uh, as long as it's legal and not stealing <laughs> other others property but right. um, yeah for, for, for Exodus I'm I, I'm not good at backgrounds I'm not good at perspective I'm not good at drawing houses and cars and everything that's solid and man-made so I don't buy at, that for a second that that, yeah. it, that is a bold-faced lie <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing is uh, being not good at that I've got to find a way to, to render the things if I want to do them myself. Uh, so I decided to take, uh, to, to go from pictures, which is a good way to work as well. The thing is, uh, the, the story is, is set in New York. So I had to go to New York, uh, which is a nice excuse to go visit New York, <laughs> actually. But uh, it ended up being a very nice st study trip because we, we noticed things we, that we wouldn't have noticed uh, if we weren't been there. Mm -hmm. uh, to take some, some reference pictures. And yeah, I took a lot of pictures. I took like 4,000 pictures in New York in, in 10 days to, to get the, all the references I needed for, for my backgrounds. Wow. But, um, and, and it, it was very useful. And now I've got to, to process them and to see which ones are useful for the books or not. I've got to read the scripts for that and because I anticipated it. Anticipate I did on the on the script, so I, I had to imagine what the things, the what shots I, I would need and stuff like that. So like pretty much like a, a, a movie director, you know. And um, I decided to to shoot a lot of a lot of pictures and then to use them to to uh, as a, as a background and to redraw them. And to add some sci-fi uh, elements in them, so we know it's New York, and you know it's in it's sci-fi, uh, but it's not really the New York you know because you modify it, which is also very interesting in a way. Well, it it blends the familiar with the unfamiliar, right? Hmm. To ground the the story somewhat, because I noticed this with your creature designs as well, is. They're just familiar enough that I know what it is, but it's just it's it's alien enough or different enough that it feels frightening. Uh, with the it's, one, it's one of the key. It's 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 one key of of um, fantasy or sci-fi design. I mean, you just take something that exists on Earth and you modify it a little bit, uh, which would be like size or maybe like the head or something. Or like you take Avatar, for instance. Uh, all the creatures in avatars, they are pretty much the same as we are, we've are. we got here, except they are all shiny and they've got six legs. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. And, um, and you've got a sci-fi creatures. Yeah. And, and, and that's it. And I did the same in, in, my, in my books and everybody does the same. You just take, you just take like a, a panda and you, you, add, you add a tail or big ears and, and, and you've got a, like an alien creature. Mm -hmm. 
And for, for, for the Elsewhere Chronicles, I, I do that. I mean, if I want a big monster that is very disgusting, I take a slug and I multiply the size by like 20, 50. I don't care. It's sci-fi. It's, it's <laughs> fantasy sci-fi. I can do pretty much what I want. Right. It's all a matter, it's all a matter of, of, of scale as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to make it epic, it's not complicated. I mean, you, you, you want an epic shot, it's not complicated at all. You just go into the forest, you take a picture of the forest, and then you, you, you draw a very small character on it and you've got the giant tree forest and it's done right <laughs> it's, it's kind of easy after that you've got to include that in in a story in a way that works in a way that's easy to read for the for the reader and and it's got to be useful to the story as well all right so now we get to what i like to call a squishy question <laughs> uh you said it has to be right for the story how do you know? I designed a cool monster. I made a thing that has a shark head with a mouse's body and bat wings. It's the coolest thing ever. How do I know whether or not it is appropriate for this story? Because that's um, the story will guide you. Will, the script you will read, the story you've got to illustrate is your guide. And you immediately know if your design is good or not. I mean, it's just... Um, I, I would say it's, it's obvious. I mean, you you don't do uh, as long as you've got um, a goal and you know what you are doing and where you're going. You cannot do anything you want. You've got like a rail, and it's uh, it's just like uh, the story tells you to draw a horse that's that has got like eight legs. You can do that, and uh, but you, can, you cannot go in every direction possible because you know that you there will be consequences after that. And if you if you do whatever you like, at one point you will have to pay for that because <laughs> you will you will have to deal with the with the choices you made before, and you've got the creatures you are you are creating, and you will have to deal with them for the world book, if not the world series, and then they've got to be. Uh, Consistent and constant, all that, all that long, and they've got to serve the the story as well. The the key is, is the story. I mean, you, you you are working for the story. You're not working to show off your skills at a creature design designer. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, we take Elsewhere Chronicles, right? Uh, a book for what? What? What's the age range that this is for? I think it's. Starting from eight to nine or something. Okay, eight or nine year olds. Uh, yeah. And if I say to you, Bannister, I got this great idea for a character for Elsewhere Chronicles for like the final book. Um, it's this guy who carries around a bunch of half decomposed severed heads on his chest. And he drinks the blood of infants in front of other people. Uh, and he, uh, you know, he, he's got needles coming out of his eye sockets. Uh, what do you think? Great, great character for the story, right? Yeah, but I mean, what's what's his background? What what is gonna what what is he gonna do in in the in the story? Why how will he interfere with the characters? And knowing that, I will know how to design it pretty much easily. It's gonna be it's gonna be easy because uh, you don't know will they have to fight or not. If they do, I will need a weapon. And if I don't need a weapon, will what is it? Is a magician or something? <laughs> a wizard? So you. I need infos to, 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 to create my, my, my character. And of course, yeah, he's got like the, the severed head on, on the scarf or, or anything. It's, uh, it's great. <laughs> but I won't, I won't design it the same way if it's for the Elsewhere Chronicles or if it's for a super hardcore uh, fantasy book for adults. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to be like, you know, it's, it's very different. You, you cannot do the same thing. I mean, you don't design. Um, it doesn't work for zombies because zombies are pretty much the same in the Earth's Chronicles or in Walking Dead, basically, because zombies, they are zombies, um, any, any story you, you read. Um, but, well, yeah, you've got to have uh, a purpose for all these designs and characters and a story behind it. And it's, um, it always comes back to the story and where you want to go and what you want to tell. And after that, you can you can design the thing you want, but you just need to serve the story. Mm. 
So it, it does, story informs a lot of these choices and really understanding the story. And sometimes that understanding of the story is an intuition thing, right? You, you know yeah. when you get it, right? Um, so maybe like you were describing reading through the script or the notes several times until you feel like you understand it is part of that process, maybe. Uh, I want to make sure we have time to talk about composition. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about there. But so we should talk about... Take a break between talking philosophy, and uh, <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about the '80s for a second. Uh, the '80s. Let's talk about these posters you did. Uh, yeah. The um, oh, what were they called? This was um, uh, uh, iconic movie shoes posters. <laughs> I think something like that. I don't really have a name for that, but yeah. It's the, so okay. yeah, the iconic footwear in movies and TV. Uh, That's right. And you did uh, and actually the, the Doctor Who poster is right behind you in the studio. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I printed it just for a test, and I did. it looks great in big. So I'm gonna be I'm gonna do several of them, I guess. Eric's posting the link in the chat, uh, uh, and it's tuxboard.com. Uh, slash posters. Oh man, I can't pronounce all these words. Uh, but tuxboard.com is where you can find it. But you can also find it on Bannister's uh, Google Plus feed and on his Facebook page. But uh, where did this come from? Like, who who sits down and says, you know what? I want to draw shoes for famous characters. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I, I I like shoes. I like sneakers mostly, but I like shoes overall. And um, I, I've got a lot. Lots of pair of shoes, and, and my wife is not happy about that. But <laughs> that's the way it is. And, and it's. I mean, I'm I'm not into uh, collecting things or into buying stuff a lot. But yeah, shoes. It's like my weak spot. <laughs> so every time I see a nice pair of shoes, I try to re restrain myself, but it doesn't last long. Anyway. So and, uh, wait, wait. So I, I, I knowing this, I have to ask this question. Uh, what is an excellent pair of shoes for cartoonists? Oh, well, uh, <coughs> the, um, the Star Wars collection from Adidas. Really? Pretty nice. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I've got three myself, and they are, I wear them in festivals and stuff like that. And, um, and uh, what else do I, did I get lately? Uh, yeah, the... Converse did a lot of uh, DC shoes and um, Batman, Superman, and superhero shoes, but they are not, yeah, they, they are a bit too pop for me. Mm -hmm. And um, also, the, the, night, yeah. the Chuck Taylors, uh, I can't wear them anymore. I'm too old now. Uh, they, they, they hurt my feet. I need something with actual arch support, you know? <laughs> so, so, comfort is important to me, at least. So, uh, but you were saying, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they are, they're pretty nice. I mean, they are. Um, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of brands, they try to do movie shoes. And, and you've got shoes that got, goes into movies, like the um, uh, Reebok just designed, uh, Reebok designed the Aliens shoes, the Stompers, which are very nice too. But you, my brother has got a pair of them, but when you wear them in real life, it just looks a bit weird. It's fun when you know what it is, but if, if you don't know what it is, just like wearing... I mean, like snow boots or something. It's weird, but it's um, it's very cool. In, in in a in a convention, it's perfect. And um, yeah, so so I I like those items. And um, for a long time, I I I, I wouldn't know what to do with that with that thing of mine. And uh, all of a sudden, I decided to do to do illustrations about shoes in movies because I wanted people to know uh, what were the shoes, I mean, the iconic shoes, not all the shoes in movies, but the <laughs> iconic ones <laughs> that everybody knows about. I wanted people to know uh, what were the names and the brands of those shoes. So I made some research and, and for most of them, I, I found what I needed. And it's, uh, it was pretty fun. And so there are movies I like and shoes I like. So yeah, let's do that. And it appears I ended up with like, even, even shoes, and I needed a uh, twelfth one just to make it round and finish. Uh, it, for, the, so, uh, for the folks who are just listening to the audio or ha who haven't seen these posters yet, the posters are just the characters' lower legs and feet in the uh -huh. top third of the poster, and then it's more of a color wash that comes down towards the bottom, and then with the yeah. character's name. 
Uh, and they're really striking posters, and they got some traction. They got passed around by quite a few people. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I just thought it was so cool that here's another example of how the Internet works. You like a thing, so you like shoes <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and then you say, you know what? I want to draw shoes. I'm going to draw some shoes. And then yeah, you make a cool. lot of people happy. <laughs> That's right. And, and it's, it's, um, it's a good example. I mean, the, the composition of the posters as well. Because I was focusing only on the shoes, so I, I, don't, I didn't need uh, the world character. So I just draw the, yeah, the, the, the lower part of the legs. And I let... I let it breathe a lot uh, under it before adding the name at the bottom of the poster, because uh, I didn't want to to I mean to to overload it too much uh, visually. I wanted to keep simple, still with some textures and and some some grain, but uh, but I didn't want to put too much details into them because I wanted them to be um, posters you could hang on your wall in your kitchen or your living room or your studio or whatever, but not to be too much annoyed or, I mean, uh, tired visually by them. Oh, that is a great, great term. Uh, you don't want people to become tired visually or visually wear them out, right? Yeah. Uh, and th that that's that is a uh, that that makes that makes a lot of things click in my head when I'm reading the Elsewhere Chronicles because so much of it is deceptively simple, but it's never so busy that I get lost in the page. It's very clear. It's it's <laughs> absolutely clear. Uh, but anyway, people should go check out those those poster designs. I think they're really great. Um, and then you also did a pole position piece recently that made me very happy as a, as a big fan of that show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was a big fan of it when I was a kid. But it's, I mean, the show in itself uh, wasn't that good, but the concept was amazing. Yep. I mean, the, the stories, they are pretty hard to follow right now as, as adults and even kids right now. I don't know if they could follow that. But, but yeah, the, the concept of those flying cars and the team and stuff, it, the 80s were all about... Uh, vehicles and teams and, and it is one of them and yeah i like and once again it's contrast i mean you've got the boy and the girl and you've got that old car and that very brand new car which actually kind of sucks because they didn't put a real brand on it it's not a real car that does exist and, right. i mean because at the time the futuristic cars that didn't exist yet of course <laughs> but <laughs> It's uh, it's still a matter of contrast, just like we talked like earlier. Yeah, it works. And the contrast between the personalities of the two talking cars, right? As well. Yeah, absolutely. All the way down, there's contrast, contrast. It's funny. Uh, you may have heard of this amazing cartoonist named Tony Cliff. Uh, of course. Yes. <laughs> he was yeah, on the show. Amazing. Oh God. Yeah. He's. I, I'm beginning to suspect he's not human. Uh, but he, he was on the show a couple episodes ago, and one of the things that we talked about was characters, and uh, he wrote this great article about how he, it was, it was uh, supposed to be about how to write strong female characters, and then as he wound his way through the article, he was like, I guess what I'm really talking about is contrast. You want lots of contrast between your characters. Mm -hmm. That's right. You want contrast in everything in your book because that's what makes the difference. By showing the differences, you show what makes the thing work, right? Uh, so, okay. We got to talk about composition on this show. Uh, and I've got some examples of your work to put on the, the air. Uh, how. I, I just had a discussion yesterday. I was in class. And I was telling my students, I gave them an assignment, and I said, you, you're you going to make a comic. There's going to be two panels in every page. Why are there two panels? Because we want contrast. We want to see which one's bigger, which one's smaller, and why. But then I said, you also must have a character, a background. You must have dialogue. And one of the students very cleverly raised his hand and said, comics don't have to have dialogue. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I read a comic that had no word balloons at all. And I said, right. and I said well, but... How did you know what was happening in the story? And he said, well, the characters did this and this and this. And then we had a discussion. Is that dialogue? Well, it's communicating meaning visually. That's dialogue, right? And it made me think about the show we were going to do today about how uh, the, the moments you choose, the shots you take, or the shots you draw communicate story. And if you don't think about that, you're missing an opportunity to really dig deep and and uh, explore, you know, some interesting story. I want to I want to pull up a page from 
let's see which which page did I have here that I wanted to use um, oh I want to say book 5 page 28 yeah 28 yeah book 5 page 28 Matt you got that one pulled up right yeah and so spoiler alert uh, a character apparently dies in this book. Uh, I say apparently because I trust that you guys are going to <laughs> reveal more information than that. Although, Elsewhere Chronicles for a book for little kids does have quite a bit of death in it, uh, but very tastefully yes, done. Does. But here are the characters reflecting on the moment. And look at this wonderful depth of field that you have here. Again, it's got the round characters with the soft round uh, scene below of where the character just died, but then they're surrounded by all these angles, the, the square rocks, this giant triangle jutting out, but uh, giving us this moment of silence, but also giving it to uh, us in a visual way. And I wrote down, like, okay, what are the three things that Nicholas is, or, or Bannister is doing in this story with composition is he's, he's evoking tone, information, and visual interest in all of these shots. So I'm wondering, like, when you're doing these kind of shots, what what are you thinking about? I mean, is this the kind of thing where you just kind of visualize it and like, yeah, that that sounds right. I'm just intuiting it, or is it something where you're doing lots of different angles on these shots to get to this? I think uh, on this one, I did several take. Uh, this one worked the most, obviously. Uh, that's why I chose it. Uh, but yes, you can you can uh, deduce a lot of things in on on this panel. You've got um, the trail from the monster that just killed the character, and you've got uh, surrounded by by some very aggressive shapes. So you know it's a uh, it's a pretty uh, I mean hostile world, mm -hmm. and uh, you've got the, the the front character who is who is packing for what's going to be like a, a trip, of course, because we are we are on a on a road trip here uh, on a journey. And you've got the, those two characters who are um, very tired and sad, and they are looking to the horizon where their friend disappeared. And that's also the um, the direction in which they will they will be going, like the page after or two pages after. So uh, you've got a lot of information in that, and that you get. Um, I mean, you get that from the earlier on from the reading of the script because it's all written in the script. I mean, when you read read the story, there is no other choice than doing that kind of shot. I mean, it's just obvious. I mean, you've got to show that. Would it be in one panel or two panels? But but I decided to do it on one just to show a bit of the scope of the of the scene of where it happens. And um, yeah, it's kind of a transition moments and you've got to let it breathe so there is not too much details so you can just dive into it i mean visually and you, you your your eyes can breathe in the in the background and it uh, it leads it leads you slowly to the to the next panels and actually the second the the next one the next panel is also uh, uh, it's a close up on the character who is uh, mourning but is by himself because is much more of a lone wolf in that case, and um, and then you start the story again. But you've got to pause the story for that, and you've got to, of course, uh, put no dialogues and just it's just like yeah, two morning panels basically. There's no, there are no empty silences in this book, though. I mean, even though this is a silent moment, it is That's loaded right. with meaning, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything. I mean, uh, we only have. 46 pages to tell our story. So we cannot waste a single panel. It's just not possible. You, you've got everything is thought, is well thought, to use the uh, properly the most space as possible and, and to, to put the more information as we can on the pages. But at the same time, we, we don't want to overload it. So we've got to restrain ourselves of from putting too much um, too much information, and uh, yeah, but everything is, is thought. I mean, in the in the third panel of the page, you've got the three characters speaking, and uh, the last one is very last in the back, in the back of it, and uh, is still is still in contemplation in in in, in mourn. 
uh, actually, and um, he's not coming back before a little bit of time. But the right. other ones already are ready to go, but he's not yet. Right. And you've got to show that. Yep. Uh, I've got another page that I want to pull up. Um, this is uh, book four, page 43. And 43. before we show it, Matt, uh, I want to describe the scene to the viewers and listeners, and we'll see what pictures they get in their head. And then we'll show what Bannister does with this, because uh, this is really interesting. This is a fantastic example of, of that kind of condensation of information which is deceptively simple. It, it appears to be simple, but it isn't. Okay, so two characters. you got an old man and a young guy riding along on a motorcycle through a rocky desert landscape, right? And they're talking to each other as they're racing along. And they're going really fast because they're trying to get to help some friends. And, you know, they're saying, like, oh, don't worry about her, Rebecca. She's just a ghost. All that better that she disappeared into thin air. Noah, why are you so mean? Actually, these are some other characters who are talking off pan... Uh, they're talking in a cave nearby where the two characters are speeding along, uh -huh. right? So we're listening to a conversation of characters in a cave while two characters are speeding along in this desert landscape. And they're driving along uh, really fast, and we also see a dog that is growling, that is behaving in a way that is, isn't quite natural. Um, and then we finally hear the old man and the boy talking, hey, kids, slow down before you chuck us over the edge because they're driving along a cliff. Uh, Don't worry, I've got this under control. And then the old man says, at the same time, or all the same, slow down or I'll toss your rear right out of here. And we hear the motorcycle engine roaring. Rrr. And then the, the, the boy says, but you said they were in danger. We have to catch up with them. Okay, so hopefully that painted some kind of a picture in your head. Now let's look at the page. Matt, can we pull it up? And what I love about this is that we're listening to that conversation in the cave while we're seeing just the environment and the characters speeding. We, we don't even see the characters in the motorcycle. All we see is the smoke up on the cliffside. And then we get a little bit closer and we see the characters in the motorcycle. Now, when I started this description, I said we see two characters in a motorcycle. But I would instinctively draw just the characters in the motorcycle, right? But you take your time to back up and show the environment and the, the incoming threats of the things speeding along the ground, that sand whale. And we see the smoke moving along the cliffside, uh, slowly closing into the characters, right? Yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a build up page. I mean, you are increasing the tension. It's right. a, it's a zoom. You are zooming into the characters, and I took the whole page to do that because I needed some. Um, I mean, the the text is very strong, and you've got to not to be redundant uh, visually, graphically with the text. So you've got to tell something else but still it's got to be in relation with that text. Right. And it, it was a good moment to, to show the, the, the environment, the, the neighborhood of that place, which is very, uh, very scary. And um, at the same time, they are coming from very far, so you've got to wait for them to come to destination. So you have to show that as well. So that's why you see them from very far, just let that little dust, um, cloud behind them, very far away, and uh, we zoom on them, and we end on a, um, we end on a, on a, on a close up uh, with a, with like some kind of a punchline or a catchphrase. I don't know really the term. The term. And um, in between, uh, yeah, I put the dog because the dog is the closest um, the closest witness of what's happening. Um, it's been uh, it's been shown before. It's been shown in the first panel and in on the previous pages and uh, we know that the dogs we know the dog is with the characters who are on right now in danger mm -hmm. but uh, I cannot show the characters in danger because I will spoil the, the word tension and, and everything will will fall apart so I just show the dogs seeing I, I, I'm doing my I mean I'm doing my Steven Spielberg that way I mean that's what he's doing all the time. I mean he's just showing people looking at scary stuff, but he's not showing you uh, scary stuff. He's just showing the fear, right, in, in the eyes of the characters. Yeah, with that uh, low angle traveling and stuff, he's very good for that. And it's the same thing in uh, in his movie War of the World, where you can see an attack of the monsters uh, behind a hill, but you don't see the attack at all. You just see the the, the army shooting at the monsters, and and the, the witnesses just 
looking at it like just amazed by, by what's going on. This is the same thing. I mean, you just uh, trust the reader and the imagination of the, the imagination of the reader uh, by just showing um, um, a result of what's happening, but it's off screen. Yeah, as we're and, yeah. And, Oh, I, well, the other thing I was going to point out was in panel one, you did this really nice thing where you just put this rock in the foreground on the left. Mm -hmm. And that simple addition, it's a simple shape, but boom, we have a sense of scale here. We have a sense of dimension and depth in that shot too, which also kind of heightens the tension because there is an enormous distance these characters yeah. have to cover before they get to their friends, right? Mm -hmm. And we've shown you very simply in one panel while other characters are talking, right? It's, it's a great example of, uh, of using composition effectively. But I love this idea also, yeah, of making sure that, I guess what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, you have to have a deep understanding about what not only what the story is about, but what every scene is about in order to pick a good composition for the shot, right? Yeah. Like what's yeah? What... You you, I mean, you've got to know you've got to know pretty much everything about everything in your story, <laughs> and uh, I mean, what's going on? Uh, what what has been? Uh, what happens? What happened before? What's going on right now? And what's going to happen next? So you can try to 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 put the best uh, out of you to 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 make the best shot possible and uh, in that particular case for the first first panel i mean you've got that foreground and the foreground is essential you you always need a foreground if you want to add a, a sense of of scale some some depth you need a foreground that is very present uh, would it be in the shadow or right like like here like lighted by the sun yeah. and um and you you need that, and it's um, I mean it's some things uh, like this. They are I wouldn't say they are obvious to me, but I don't think about them that much. I mean they are um, common sense for me, you know. Sure. And they are the re they are the result of everything I've watched and and read during these past thirty five years. So it's. Uh, yeah, it's something that this is something that works. So I don't see why I would try to do it differently. And if I would, uh, it wouldn't work. Right. So it's uh, you know. it, it well when you draw, when you draw enough pages. This is another thing that like I get asked every once in a while. Like, oh, how do I how do I become a graphic novelist or a BD artist or a comics artist? And it it sucks to say it, but it really does boil down to make a lot of comics. Because you will, this will become an apparent language to you. How do you, th 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 okay, you're talking in your second language right now to me, right? And you're doing it very well. Uh, but when you're talking in French, I bet you don't have to think about it as much when you're talking in French, right? Yeah. It, because it's your that's natural right. language. And when you spend time with it, like, it, it, that's like asking somebody, like, how do I, how do I learn to speak German? Speak German a lot, you know, read, yeah, read stuff. Just practice. <laughs> there, 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 is no, there is no, I mean, there is no magic trick or anything, no easy solution. You've got to practice. Right. That's it. I mean, I mean, some people are a little bit more gifted than others. I mean, they've got that little spark. Some doesn't have maybe, but I guess like with work, anybody can get to get somewhere. Right. And I mean, for comics, for music, for anything. You've got to practice. If you don't practice, you you won't get nowhere. It doesn't come from 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 nothing. Right. You know? it, it, I I took two years of German in high school, and I used to be able to speak German very very well, uh, yeah. almost fluently, and mm -hmm. uh, I I can't even re I can remember how to say where's the toilet now uh, because yeah, I had, yeah it's the same for me. I, I I took six years of German in 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 high school as well, and and I don't. No, anything left. Because you didn't use it. Left. You don't use it every day, right? And when you use it every no. day, you stay in practice and fluid. Okay, I got one more example I want to cover, and I know Sharon Iverson is in the building, ready to do some book recommendations. But I got one more example. Uh, this is book one, page five. Book one, the fifth page, and okay, I'm going to do the same thing again I did before. I'll do it very quickly for the listeners and viewers. I'm going to describe the scene. So you have some kids watching a funeral and uh there's three boys hanging out in you know on the periphery of the um 
cemetery, and a, a little girl who was at the funeral with her family comes walking up to the boys to talk to them. And they go through their introductions, and uh, as they're going through their introductions, the little girl explains that, oh, those guys, those people over there that I'm with, that's my family, and the guy who they're burying is my grandfather. So there's a little bit of information to get across here. And you managed to get through this in, what, five panels, the, final, the last five panels of the page. We can pull it up now, Matt. Uh, we cover all this ground, but in a way that is visually interesting and also very elegant because when Rebecca points to her family to say, oh, yeah, I'm with those guys over there, and then you close in on the dad who waves and smiles friendly, it feels like a natural progression because we're peering through that hole that you created with the character's legs and the hole in the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... Um once again, I'm just illustrating uh, what I saw when I read the script. And it's, um, I mean, in the end, we talk about the dad, so I got to show him. It's the first time we, we show him for real, basically, because, yeah, I mean, no, we, we saw him like the page before, but, but this time he's interacting with the, with the character, so he's got, he's got to be a closet. And uh, that first panel, when she's going toward them, I mean, it's, um, you've got, as well, a lot of information. I mean, you you know she's going backward because she's going to the towards the left of the of the panel, mm -hmm. and we, she's. I mean, she. We, we saw her back, so we are obviously following her towards those those little boys in the back, and I added some um, that little house that that shed in in the end of the of the cemetery to show it's the very back of it. Mm -hmm. It's very far away, and um, and that's it. And then after that, they they talk each other, they, they talk to each other and they interact. And you've got, um, you've got to, to vary your, your shots. So it doesn't, it doesn't look that they, like they are all, I mean, talking heads. You, you've got to, to vary your shots so people don't get bored by reading the thing. And it, it's like you are in the middle of the conversation, in the conversation, and you are uh, looking at one character, then the other one who is answering. And um, and after that, you've got to to use some some I mean like um, directing effects to to get the reader uh, where you want him and where where you want them to get. I mean it's um, by by taking that shot on the um, before last panel, the almost last panel. Uh, it's um, I mean it's like. It's like a, a, a visor. I mean, you, you're just like aiming at those group of characters. Mm -hmm. Basically, you've got you've got the round shape, and you've got the girl looking towards them. So you are obviously looking with her towards them. And then after that, you see the father in close shot, um, which is once again just like the obvious way to 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 do it for me. But it seems very very easy, you know, at the time to to do that. Sure, but this so is, this is the kind of thing that a lot of beginning cartoonists will lose sight of. Is they'll just they would they might show um, a close up of Rebecca and show her pointing mm -hmm. off panel, and then the next panel is a close up of the dad waving, without any sense of space or blocking, and without intellectually guiding us to the next thing that we're going to see. Right. That's right. And after that, it's uh, it's also a matter of, of um, sensibilities. I mean, I'm I, I love. Uh, storytelling and I love when the, the panels they are uh, flowing very fluently yeah. uh, one after each other so so you don't have to fight I mean the worst thing I would I, I want to do when I read a comic book is to fight against it and I don't want to try and understand what's going on I mean it's, it's got to be obvious it's got to be very fluent and fluid it's got to yeah to to flow very easily, and you you just don't think about what you read. You're just in it, and you. I'm trying to to give that sensation to the reader that is in the story, and at no point I've got to take him out by making a mistake of uh, like the, with the wrong shot or storytelling or showing off for whatever reason. So it's just a matter of serving the story the 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 better way possible. One of, the, one of the things I'm hearing in all of our discussions today is you have to live in the story before you can live in the world, right? Uh, oh, yeah, you do. Yeah. You, you completely do. I mean, when, when I'm drawing my pages, I'm completely with the characters. So I'm way more involved uh, emotionally than the readers will be because I'm spending way more time with them 
than you guys are while reading the book. But, uh, but still, I'm, when, when I'm doing that, I'm completely, uh, I mean, taking the readers with me and, I, and I'm hoping that at least they will get uh, a little bit of uh, what I'm living when I'm drawing it, you know? Yeah. Can you believe we've been talking for an hour already? Yeah, no. Already, wow. <laughs> that went so fast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The, the, the show goes so fast. So we've got to do book recommendations, but I want to give you a final word before we move on to talking about uh, books, uh, Bannister. Any, any final thoughts on this composition thing? I think you summed it up really well. I mean, go for the easy, easiest shot, the, the obvious one. I mean, uh, don't try to, to do something just to impress people. Just try to tell your story the best way possible and the most, uh, the most easiest, the easy way possible. And, and you will get your, your effects uh, all the time. I mean, most of the, of the books that are classics now, they are very uh, simple and obvious in, in storytelling and, and, and shots choices. That is so good. That is so good. All right. So, okay. Well, I, I, I told you that we were going to be doing book recommendations. I don't know if you picked any. Uh, I see Sharon Iverson has an enormous pile. I've got, uh, <laughs> yeah, what do I have? Okay, I'll, I'll let you organize your books while we let Sharon do her uh, book recommendations sure. first. So. I'm ready when you are. All right, awesome. So, Sharon Iverson, a comics.aadl.org. So good to have you back. It's been a while. Is, is, is your mic on? Is my mic on? It is it now. It is now. Uh, there we go. Okay. All right. So. Hi, so, Sharon. Hi, Bannister. You know, I want to thank you um, for being oh. on the show here because I haven't read the Elsewhere Chronicles, and I've got three of them, and I've, I've got, got the, the rest. rest. <laughs> I, no, <laughs> and I've got a bunch on hold um, because I just fell in love with them, seeing the, the shots that you guys just discussed and, and all, and, um, and to see that um, critics are comparing it to Bone, oh my gosh. So it's, I can't I resist do, yeah, this. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. <clears throat> it's actually really, really cool. Much. I can see that, actually, because it starts out very innocent mm -hmm. and it gets progressively more and more dangerous as the story progresses very much like bone where that's right yeah where you you think okay well they're fine they're back home now and then oh no no there's another complication and and when i said there's a lot of death there's a lot of death and but it's done in a very tasteful way and the way the character <laughs> well <laughs> it's not gratuitous it's it's not nobody comes in with a machine gun and just mows people down it's like when a character oh, dies the death has a consequence and a meaning, yeah. right? And it's and not. A, and a purpose, yes. Yeah, it has a purpose, and it, and I don't mean the jumping in front of the bullet purpose. I mean that there there's a part where just an animal in the story dies, and you see how the characters react to that, and that's the meaning of that death, right? Uh, so. Yeah, it's a fantastic book, isn't it? Yeah, it's so good. Well, well, I didn't look at it too close because I don't have volume one, and I'm going to read them in order. Um, I'll turn mine in today. But that's I'm okay. done. With that's okay. That's okay. So, but, so that's that's one thrilling um, series and result of getting to be on today. Yeah. Um, you suggested I look around for some books that are produced. Um, in France or by French, and yeah. I thought you were going to bring this one because well, yeah, we, we both we both brought this one on the same day when yes. we were going to do a book talk on it. Exactly. This is a fantastic book. This is this is Ariel yes. uh, by Emmanuel Joubert. Am I saying that right? And Mark Boutevon. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you my favorite story. I've got bookmarked here is, um, and it and it in terms of composition, it's pretty simple. It's the Operation ATM where <laughs> oh, Ariel good, and yeah. his dad are on the way to um, extract money from the bank, and it's mostly in the car with a yeah. little bit outside. But it's just hilarious the way that Ariel's, you know, like we're on an op now, you know, <laughs> and and what happens, and even the it's way about a it's about a little boy donkey. Yes, little boy donkey and his life experiences adventures right um his wonderful exuberant imagination um, he loves thunder like horse thunder horse <laughs> yes <laughs> wishes he could be thunder horse but realizes according to his parents that he's more like thunder horse than um his best 
horse friend at school. Right. Um, so, yeah, no, I totally, totally love this book um, so much that this is mine. Um, <laughs> it is. A, it's a fantastic comic uh, for anybody who's a fan of observational humor. Mm -hmm. uh, really. Well, Calvin and Hobbes, anybody who loves Calvin and Hobbes would love Ariel. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. So. And then and then because I was looking around um, in our world languages collection, I found Burkett um, by Francis Francis um, Descharnay. Descharnay. And um, it's a really cool book, I believe, done by a French Canadian about a young girl whose father encourages her to experience other cultures. And as a result, if I can go to she she wears a burqa. And um, it, excuse me, it shows kind of her experience at school, you know, basically under this tent. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and, it, and it's, uh, you know, really cool. There's other people in the story who are wearing their outfits, probably Catholics and so forth, nuns. Yeah. Um, and, and this evidently has, you know, I can't resist when I start to investigate People like Bannister, it's like, all right, let's check on the web. And this has been made into some animated oh. um, sequences, too, which look like a lot of fun um, through her experiences. Um, the chicken thief. I can't resist this. It's, te <laughs> it's technic In it's our so library, good. it's not technically a graphic novel, but, oh, my gosh, the way that this um, dimension of book is used to show um, the action of, in this first story, yeah. about a thief chicken or fox thief who steals a chicken and how well Beatrice Rodriguez uses each of these long horizontal panels to convey the action but also to share so much else that's going on yeah. in the story all without words yep. very very cool it's it all the dialogue happens through the characters gestures yeah. And and there is a big yeah. surprise at the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's su that is such a good book. Yeah, a lot of people have been talking about that one, but it's it's worth it's worth talking about. And there's uh, there's so many others. We have of course Louis Trondheim. This is the Tiny Tyrant, and we have a lot of his adult books as well. Um, and I do not know if I'm saying is it Jean Svar? Yeah, how do you say that, Bannister? Um, Jean Svar. Joan's Farm. Joan's Farm or Joan's Farm, it depends. But okay. Joan's Farm, most of the time. Well, I brought out Le Petit Prince, but the one I'm actually, and I've read this, and it's great, but the one I'm going to take home and read is Vampire Loves. Vampire Loves. It's this really good. Just, Have you read it yet? No. Oh, I opened it up, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> this one definitely looks like a winner. Yeah. And, of course, there's so many others. Captain Static. Um, and, and I, this is, I took French uh, many years ago, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I had to learn more on the reading end, and it surprised me that I got most of the gist of it, but this is about a kid who um, starts out normal, but then develops evidently in a, a powerful static charge, and how that changes his life, and there's a whole series of books, uh, a whole series of books, I think we just have some, and the author is Alain M. Bergeron, and uh, I could go on with Tintin and all the others, but and and of course I brought our collection, almost our whole collection of flight, which have a lot of your stories in it, Bannister. My fav one of my favorites Sorry. was the one about the cooking duel. Oh yeah, the action <laughs> between the the um, young man and woman who you know challenge each other who can make you know the better the better meal and first and their race to the store to get the ingredients oh it's a, it's a mushroom quiche isn't it or something yes. like that and oh my you god the recipe at the end of the story as well yes and i'm gonna i'm gonna try that so thank you yeah, it's a good one Oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, it, it's been written by my wife, and the recipe is from her, too. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a very fun story. I had a lot of fun drawing it, and it's, it, it was one of the first stories we, we did together. Oh, fun. Oh, cool. Cool. Okay. So, what, so, we got, like, all eight? Almost. I couldn't almost. get them all. Um, I, got, I couldn't get volume one, but... Oh, I, well, Bannister's not in that one, so who cares? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> We got it's the important one. one. We it's got the, all of it's a very important one. <laughs> yes, yes. But the, all of these are in the library's collection. Yes. So yes. is is Ariel in the library? 
if it isn't, yes, it oh, is. Oh, good. I believe so, because I think I had the library's copy the day I whipped it out. And, you know, you're like, <laughs> do you, have you read this? And I went, <laughs> <laughs> So all of these books will be in the show notes, archived at comicsgreat.com slash CAG85. And, mm -hmm. and just go to comics.aadl.org, uh, folks, to find all these amazing books. Uh, any, any other ones? There's... Well, oh, you got you got events. I, I just wanna I just wanna bring up that October six here at the library on Sunday, uh, which is October six, um, one to three p.m. at the downtown library, we'll have uh, comics artist Justin Castaneda driving over from Chicago to share um, some things about visual storytelling and writing from life, which it sounds like you do too, Bannister. We all do, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and he, he, of course, is the author of some books, uh, series, When I Was Little. So. And he's been a uh, guest at Kids Read Comics. Yes. And, yeah, a, a, a vital part of the Southeast Michigan comic scene. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the Comics Artist Forum, if you haven't heard of it, uh, is a, a free event put on every month, first Sunday of the month, where we have a guest speaker do a 20, 40 minute little thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's just general time to hang out and draw with other local cartoonists. And a lot of lo uh, local cartoonists come to that thing, both kids and adults. Mm -hmm. uh, that's on the fourth floor conference fourth room. Fourth floor, yep. Fourth floor conference room at the downtown branch of the Ann Arbor District Library. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. So uh, October 6th. Yep. We'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, so Bannister, do you have any book recommendations you wanted to talk about? I've got two very quickly. Um, I will promote uh, my uh, friend's books. So the, the first one is, I don't know if you see that. Yes. Big Bang uh, it's Cats. It's just been out in France right now. It's the Big Bang, Big Bang Cats. It's, uh, it's a story about um, a group of losers in high school who are uh, making a rock band. And they've got to play hidden behind masks. So it's very funny. It's been uh, written by my wife. Yeah. Oh, and, wow. Um, <laughs> and it's uh, the the artist is actually a young artist from Russia. She lives in Moscow and she's very very talented. You can find her on the net. Uh, she's named Anna Katish, cool. and it's uh, it's a very very fun story. And the other one is uh, also from a friend. It's brand new. It's not even in French yet, nor in English. It's uh, just in Finnish because the guys from Finland, and he was in flight too, so you can look for him in flight as well. His name is uh, Yippe Ahonen, and um, his new book is called Perkeros. I don't know if I pronounce it all right, but uh, it's um, it's a story about the rock band as well. It's it's all about music today, <laughs> and it's um, it's about uh, metal, rock metal, and um, and black magic. Ooh. And it's uh, it's amazing. The, the art inside is is just crazy. It's a it's a very big book, like 192 pages, wow. and I think uh, they are currently uh, working on a deal for uh, publishing it in the U.S. very soon. Okay. Very cool. And uh, it's going to be the same for Big Bang Cats anyway. So I've, I've got no no doubt you guys can read it pretty soon. And we should say also that uh, once again this October November right. area, uh, Tib, Tib and, and Tum Tum. Tum Tum. Yeah, Tib and Tum Tum. The book one will be on October, and the book number two will be very shortly after, because they waited for us to do book number two before releasing it releasing them to the to the US market. And this is about a little boy caveman who yeah, and his pet dinosaur. In he a found a dinosaur in the, in the, in the wild and uh, it's uh, it's basically the story of the first dog. I mean he, he wants to he wants to have a friend because he is all by himself. He's mocked by his friends, I mean so-called friends. And uh, he found the dinosaur in the wild and he wants to to bring it to to to, to the clan but of course the adults they don't they don't want it. And uh, the dinosaur is very funny. He's very, very agile and very flexible, so he, he can make a lot of postures. And it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's about it's a uh, it's a one page gags gag at the same time. I mean, uh, and uh, on one page, and uh, but it makes a war story in the end of the book. So it's very it's very funny. So That's my novelty right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then we will we will watch your Google Plus stream and your Facebook page to see more developments That's for right. Exodus. I will keep posting stuff to for you to enjoy and people to follow what I'm doing and the creative process behind all that. 
it's really fun to watch. So yeah, uh, and and if anybody's out there listening who has the rights to the pole position cartoon show, <laughs> I'd love to see a reboot of the of the show as a comic, and uh, I think Bannister would do a great job on it. I'd be glad to give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Bannister, thank you so much for being part of this show. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that because I would love to have you back. This was a really fun conversation. And uh, same goes to you, Sharon. Sure. We'll see you again. Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Promise. Mm -hmm. I'm holding you to it. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, uh, so Bannister can be found at Facebook.com slash Nicholas period. Nicholas with just a C. No H. And I see uh oh -L -A -S. yes <laughs> banister b-a-n-n-i-s-t we'll link to it in the show notes and you can also find him on google plus um and then sharon iverson we can't find her anywhere no she's she's invisible to the yeah i just looking. come out once a, a great moon <laughs> blue moon <laughs> uh and then uh thanks to the Ann Arbor district library for putting the show on every two weeks matt in the control room and eric who's monitoring the chat and then tom who helps out in the in the technical direction of the show and thanks to the Ann Arbor district library for uh you know, letting me do this thing in your facilities. Uh, the show will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG85. You can listen to an audio version of the show. You can listen, uh, watch a video of the show on YouTube. It's also on Stitcher if you want to stream it on your mobile device. Uh, any place where you can get audio, you can probably find this show. So thanks again, everybody, for listening and watching. Until next time, I have been Jersey Droz of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. <laughs> Nope.